One application for momentum that we'll use a lot is something called collisions. This is used kind of the way that people use it in English, but with sort of restricted physics meaning. But first, let's practice one of our previous problems. Two blocks sit at rest on a frictionless level surface. One block has mass 1.2 kilograms, but the other mass is unknown. A mass of spring between them, which is not shown in the picture, decompresses, after which the 1.2 kilogram block has a speed of 1.7 meters per second, and the unknown mass has a speed of 0.78 meters per second. Find the value of m, the unknown mass, answering in kilograms. Um, it wasn't explicit about directions, but they have to go this way. Whatever way this one flies off, the other has to fly off the other way along a line so that the momentum ends up adding to zero, which is what it started at. It's pretty straightforward to say that the momentum stays the same because the spring is internal to the system. But we started with zero momentum at the start because nobody was moving. After we have this thing moving at 1.7 and this thing moving the other way, I put this in as a minus to indicate the direction. So I could just use the speed of 1.7. And we solve that over for m, and we find that m is the momentum of the leftward guy over the velocity of the rightward guy, or 1.7 kilograms times 1.78 meters per second over 0.78 meters per second, or 2.62 kilograms. So if this a collision is basically a process in which uh, there's a well-defined start and end, and it's generally of short duration, during which time we don't really care about the forces that are going on. It's when things hit each other, but we can sometimes generalize a little past that. We classify collisions in terms of how the energy changes. Notice that during the collision, the momentum won't change, so it will never be about how the momentum changes. But the kinetic energy might change. In a perfectly inelastic collision, and notice here this inelastic collision, uh, we get the maximum loss of kinetic energy. The two objects end up sticking together. Elastic is a general term in English for a thing that can deform and go back to its original shape. So like the stretch elastics of say gym pants or something like that, where you or the tennis ball where it will deform, but then it'll go back to where it was. Um, a perfectly inelastic object then would be a thing that doesn't return to its original shape even a little. And that's really the case when two things stick together and move off as one object. An inelastic collision in general would have some loss of kinetic energy because there's deformation of the objects. It might not be perfect loss the way a perfectly inelastic collision would be. For inelastic and for perfectly inelastic collisions, the kinetic energy is usually lost to heat, which is expressed as thermal energy. There might be some loss to light and maybe some loss to sound if it makes a noise, but almost all of it gets lost to heat. An elastic collision, on the other hand, is when the kinetic energy is conserved as well as the momentum being conserved. The objects bounce apart perfectly. Uh, that's a really restrictive case, although it's a really important case, so keep in mind. Sometimes this would be called perfectly elastic to emphasize again that there might be some bouncing back in this kind of case. There might be some little bouncing, but here the object bounced back perfectly. And there's even this thing called super elastic, uh, which is fancy, but it says kinetic energy is somehow gained during the collision. Usually some sort of release of internal energy the objects already had, such as an explosion or a, a spring decompressing. This is what we mean by perfectly inelastic collision. Nothing particularly special, it's exactly what it sounds like. They're moving at each other beforehand, they stick and they move off. Because of it, you can treat them as a combined mass of m1 plus m2, which can be useful sometimes. For instance, these two boxes are sliding along a frictionless surface. They collide and stick together. Afterward, find the velocity of the two boxes. And this is pretty straightforward because, again, the initial momentum is going to equal the final momentum. And since they stick together, of course, the final momentum is just the sum of their masses times the final speed. But the initial mo momentum here is kind of interesting because we have one kilogram times minus uh, times plus four meters per second, and we have two kilograms at two meters per second, and that's zero. So there was no momentum before, so there's no momentum after. So it doesn't really matter what this number was. This has to be zero. So it is at rest. That's obviously a special case. Uh, interesting, but special case. All right, a 10, kilo, a 10 gram billet is fired into a one kilogram wood block where it lodges. Subsequently, the block slides along f four meters across the floor where mu equals 0.2. What was the bullet's speed? 
And there's a hint here, which is that you can find the speed of the block and bullet just after the collision by treating the subsequent motion as constant acceleration. As always in physics, we probably should start off by drawing a picture. So I'm going to draw, I'm going to call this guy M2. I'm going to hit him with a bullet. Hit it with a bullet. Oops. Coming in with speed V1 and having mass M1. And then the collision happens. Kerpow. And we end up with a bullet that's stuck inside the thing. And they are both moving off with speed V2. But the floor is rough. So it moves some distance along this rough floor. And then comes to rest. And we were given both the mu for the floor and also the distance it slid. Working the problem a little bit backwards, since we end at rest and we started at some speed, we can use the second the kinematic equation involving v squares. The final speed squared is the initial speed squared plus twice times the acceleration times delta x. So this equation looked like this back in chapter 2 or whatever it was. We need to be a little careful as we do this because we'll have different things that we're calling finals and so on. Here, the v2 is our initial velocity and 0 is our final velocity. Uh, we also kind of use a result we ran into a lot where if we think about our free body diagram, we've got gravity pulling down and a normal pushing up and a frictional force pushing this way and that's going to give us the acceleration so we'll have FF equals MA but FF is also mu FN which is mu MG and that's where all of this stuff came from. If we do all that rigmarole we end up with 2.8 meters per second as the velocity after the collision. Now we can do the momentum part and we can say well during this collision that we don't care about um, we went from having some velocity to having v2, so we start off with just the bullet moving, but after they're moving together, so and then we just do some algebra, and we find it's 282.8 meters per second. Alright, the figure shows two train cars that move towards each other and couple together. In an earlier example in the textbook, we had used concentration of momentum to find the final velocity shown in the figure from the given initial values, which are shown here. How much thermal energy is created in this collision? We're going to flash back to that. We're going to be using, we're going to find an initial kinetic energy, which is one half the mass of the first times its initial speed squared, plus one half mass of the second times its initial speed squared. And then we're going to have some kinetic final. That's going to be easy because it's one half the sum of their masses times that final speed squared. And then we know that delta K is going to give us E thermal. Well, almost with a minus sign because delta K will be negative, but we know that everything lost in kinetic energy is gained in thermal energy. Running in numbers, we see that these things, which are moving relatively quickly, one meter per second, drop to about a quarter of their speed, and as such, they lost really almost all of their kinetic energy. And the change in kinetic energy ends up being 44,000 joules compared to original energy of 46,000 joules. So they've lost something like, what is that, like 90% of their energy, a little bit more. All right, object X with mass M0 travels to the right with velocity V0. Object Y of mass 2M0 is traveling to the left with velocity 2V0 as shown. They collide and stick together. What's the change in kinetic energy of the two-object system from immediately before to immediately after this collision? You can grind this out. Um, and there's an answer that will come out that we'll get soon. But you can actually leverage the form of the question to give you some idea. For instance, we know that during a collision like this, we lose energy. So these two can't be the right answers. Because it does not increase. We're down to only one of these two. Then we can look at the kinetic energy. The initial kinetic energy is 1 half m0 v0 square plus 1 half 2 m0 2 v0 quantity squared which is 1 half m0 v0 square plus, and when you grind all this out, it's a half times 2 times 2 squared, that's 4 m0 v0 squared. So we get uh, 
4.5 m0 v0 square, which doesn't tell us a lot until we look at the answers. And we see in answer D, it's going to decrease, decrease by 6. But it only has 4.5, so it can't decrease by 6. So that one's out as well, which means the actual answer has to be C, without doing any further calculation of what the final energies would be, which is good because they're a little grungy. You have to figure out the final velocity and then compute its final kinetic energy. The final velocity bizarrely turns out to be the same speed but in the other direction. It's weird. And so it ends up being... Uh, one and a half, it ends up with 1 half mv0 squared as the final kinetic energy. Uh, sorry, it's the 3 halves mv0 squared is the final kinetic energy, and that's why we get that the difference is 3. But the brute force method is not particularly informative.